In our fourth section of our technical animation segment, we'll be merging in the ragdoll setup we did in the first segment, the first section, with what we had before with the secondary motion and our new animation clip. So on this left side here, it's all stuff that we've looked at in the third section, where we set up the secondary motion, bring in the animation, uh, make it locomotive so it moves through space, and then apply all these secondary motion effects. Um, and then towards the right here, we have um, in this... Um, lila box here, our ragdoll setup, with a few nodes added extra, which I'm going to explain in just a second. So one important bit I want to mention here is that since we did the, this setup first for the actual animation, then we want to be using this as well when we actually run the ragdoll simulation on top of it, because adding motion to ears, trunk and tail will change slightly how the ragdoll will behave since we have different motion in our in initial clip. So getting as close as possible to the final result from the get-go is will save us time in the long run. So let's start here on the right side. We've went through these nodes beforehand. Uh, on the configured joints sub, specifically, there's nothing new. So this stays exactly the same as it we've configured in our first section of the, the segment. On ragdoll collision shapes, we have something new here. And I'm just going to go ahead and start here. We see that we've got the shapes are now colored, and the ones in the back here, so the pelvis and the thighs, uh, are a, a deeper, darker color. What the color symbolizes here is the density of each shape. And we see here we have this configure RBD properties per shape toggle, which is turned on, whereas when we configured it, it was off. The reason for this is as we were always going through the motion and tweaking these, these parameters, I noticed that the, the back of the elephant in terms of actual volume of the shapes, it's fairly small compared with the rest of the body. And we definitely wanted more weight in the back as the elephant is tripping and, and falling onto the platform. So to achieve that, what you can do if you don't want to manipulate the shapes or you know change their, their volume in any way in the state, you can enable this option here and that's going to allow us to set RBD properties per shape. And these RBD properties are amongst others, friction, bounce, rotational stiffness, and the density, which is the one we've set here. So if we click on the pelvis here, we see our density is set to five. So this is gonna be five times heavier than what the volume dictates. And this helps us get that uh, weight in the back of the elephant. Next up on our regular constraints, um, everything stays the same, except we are introducing an external constraint here which will also um, bring us to our new, newly added nodes. So the stash sub here is just a ground, which is a bit farther away from the, the origin, because remember our animation, if we actually come here and play it, our animation moves through space, so it goes forward, well, towards the z-axis, that is. And we want to trip the elephant, or you know, for this particular scene at least, we found that where we want to trip the elephant is around frame 142. So around frame 142 is where we want our elephant to trip here, basically. So that's why I've positioned this, this platform uh, in here in space, so that we've got the collider with the ragdoll in the right spot. Another mention here, as uh, was also mentioned before, remember, the reason we want our skeleton to move through space when we run the ragdoll is to get that proper nice uh, velocity of it moving when it trips and sort of falls forward. So we have to position this ground to roughly where the elephant will, would end up. Um, there are obviously procedural or more procedural ways of doing this, but for our shot, we knew that our anim the animation wouldn't change much. So I just transformed this myself by hand and used it um, like that. So we're feeding this ground in this third input of our regular constraints, the, uh, the input being the collision geometry. We can also see it here. And then what we're doing is we're creating an external constraint here between our left foot. So we can zoom a bit here. And we can see the actually here. It's where it goes because this is at rest frame. So we see the left foot here in the back and the platform. So we see this red line going all the way to the, this point on the platform here, that point right there. And I'm just choosing, choosing the point, referencing any point index, which again, 
I knew that the platform wouldn't change, so I could just easily uh, select an index automatically. There are ways to procedurally create groups. I'm not going to go into that right now. And that's, that's basically it. So we're creating it here. Then these two nodes are only used to delete the constraint after we're done using it. So this switch here is tied to an expression you can show here. So we've got when our frame, so our current frame that we're going through, is higher than whatever we set for our transition on the ragdoll solver, plus three, just random like offset. Um, then we want to switch off. So look at this line, the constraint disappears. So at frame, as we said, 142 is when the transition starts, plus 3, that's 45. So when it's higher, so 146, we want our constraint to disappear. And the reason for this is this is a fairly uh, like a classic RBD workflow is because we want our elephant to trip by the constraint. And then we want the constraint to be gone to not be affecting our elephant at all. Just let him like follow his basically trip motion naturally. This blast has nothing important. Uh, unique, just setting the which primitive we want to delete, which in our case is 38. Again, there are more procedural ways to do this, but in this case, it was all fairly set up, so we didn't need to, to go that much in depth. And then here at the bottom, we've got our ragdoll solver, and we can also see the constraints here. So we've got the glue constraint and our elephant. Now, the constraint itself, even though it exists on frame one, it's not going to take effect because we have a transition in place here, which only allows our sim to start at frame 142. So up until 142, our elephant will just run the animation. We can see the constraint remaining attached to the foot, but not actually being uh, in effect. And then uh, as we reach frame 142, so right about here, but it's exactly where we want it to be at compared to the platform is when the constraint takes place and we see our, our leg remains pinned in place and then that causes our elephant to trip and then after five frames or four frames rather three four frames we release the constraint so we let our leg keep going forward to simulate this tripping motion another point here is that in order to have the constraint actually disappear when we set it to upstream using this blast we want to make sure we take this override external constraint from SOP. Otherwise, bullet or the ragdoll solver will not read the constraint on each frame because it's just more costly. And it's going only going to read it on frame one, which means our constraint will not disappear. So by checking that, we make sure we read the constraint on each frame. So if we do anything to the constraint on a time dependent stream, like we are doing here, where we're deleting it after a certain frame, we can read that in and have it take effect. And Besides this bit, we have here a few motors in place as well for the trunk. Again, I'm not going to go over these very specific parameters of the node. It's just worth mentioning that we are setting a few motors just to keep the trunk a bit more, more steady during the fall. And once this was you know, tweaked enough and we're happy with the results, parameters and all that stuff, this is basically the moment or the second time when you, you can go back to your rotation limits on the configure join SOP at the beginning of the stream here and configure any of them further if you if you want to tweak the the result here. So once this is done, we're basically ready to send it this back to our animator to add the last touches and fix up, add some more nice movement to the overall motion once we've we've simmed it. But before that, remember what I said, we're gonna keep this static, so in place. So here we can uh, just do an extract locomotion to keep our character in place so it doesn't move away from the origin. And the other nodes here are in just a bit of an extension. So one thing also that kind of played into what I mentioned before with the ragdoll behaving a bit better if you get that through the world motion in the animation and then let the velocity play a, a part when you sim the trip in this example. Uh, we also decided it would be better and it would look better if we keep our character in place, but when we actually run the trip, so when the ragdoll kicks in, we allow a bit of that blending from the, the forward falling back into our animation. So let me show you what I mean. If we just display this, we see it going and then it's supposed to trip and it just falls down. And it looks a bit, you know, like it's walking on a, on a treadmill or something like that. 
So we wanted when it trips here to have him like go forward. So since our ragdoll already has this, because that's how we set it up, remember with why well, that's what we did with the locomotive motion, we can just take our uh, animation here. There we got trip vop on frame 142. So basically set up by here on the this time shift. We want to start blending our animation back here. So this is just a fairly simple, um, just getting the pelvis that you can hear very easily. So we're looking at the locomotion joint here and here the pelvis. And we are uh, uh, completing the offset of the locomotion between the each frame and what this time shift was set to. So basically ends at 143, which means that from frame 1 to 143, we'll be getting a zero delta because they're basically the same. And then at 143, our time shift locomotion will stop. So the delta will begin to increment itself. And then we apply that delta onto the pelvis, which will make the pelvis actually be uh, offset in space. And then we have skeleton blend to blend just a bit of that animation back onto our skeleton if we don't want the whole thing. This again was just experimentation with the values of figuring out what works. So now we're getting something where our elephant like walks and then when it trips, we get it going forward, which looks a bit more believable and yeah, works, works nice for this particular scene. And as mentioned in the previous section, before we close this one off, uh, a bit of a corrective shape for the tail, because when it lifts up here, we had some protrusions going about without the rig pose. So we're getting this type of motion. And the easiest fix here, again, would be to just drop a rig pose and offset our tail by a little bit. So just a couple of keyframes, very easily done, just to make sure we're not getting any of those visible um, on camera. And that is basically the, the main setup with secondary motion. And that being said, now we're ready to uh, export the skeleton animation as an FBX, send it back to the animator so he can clean it up, uh, add some extra, um, extra movement to make it even more natural and look cool. And before we wrap up this segment, we're going to take what the animator gives us as a last piece and run secondary motion again. <laughs> 